Well, since we are not dismissing the youngsters and their teachers today, I'll invite you all to join me at the throne of grace again, and let's go to the Lord and ask his tutelage through his spirit and his word. Father, as you open our Bibles, we confess that it is inspired by you. It finds its origin, its source in God alone. It is written inerrantly. There's no errors in it. Any issue it speaks to of science or geology or any other issues, it speaks without error. Man constantly has to play catch up. It is authoritative over our lives. It is sufficient giving all the answers to the questions of life that need to be answered. And so we dig into it afresh. And as we go to Hosea that we began last week, give us understanding Convict our own hearts, exhort us towards righteousness. For your own praise and glory, we ask it. Amen. Well, beloved, I'd like to preach to you about Hosea's family tree. Anybody that knows anything about Hosea knows a lot about his wife and a lot about his kids. And they are anything but what the average saint would pray for, for their marriage or for their parenting. Realizing that God does not always consult our script to life. And yet, man's sin is no match for the abounding grace of God, which is cover to cover in this Old Testament book. So as you take your Bibles and go over to Hosea 1... Maybe it's where pages might be sticking together a bit. Too many think it a minor issue to ignore the minor prophets, the last 12 books of the Old Testament. John Calvin retorted, I have undertaken to expound the 12 minor prophets. They have been long ago joined together and their writings have been reduced to one volume. And for this reason, lest by being extant singly in our hands, they should, as it often happens, disappear in course of time on account of their brevity. Well, rather than allow them to disappear, we're seeking to bring them to the fore in our study of Hosea. As we come to this real account of a divinely called disreputable marriage. Maybe we ought to consider the question, what, ha- what do you do when God doesn't consult your script for marriage or parenting? No one has experienced such treachery as this man, Hosea. His experience was horrific enough in his day when God commanded him to go and marry a prostitute. And yet it lives on in infamy throughout the annals of history as a divine object lesson. That this is not just about Hosea and Gomer. The reason why God commanded him to do this dastardly deed is that he might put his grace on display and bring to the fore the bleakness and the blackness of his treacherous people. Time and again, Israel was unfaithful to God. Like I said, anyone who knows anything about the account of Hosea know the point that his wife turned in to a harlot. And as it, to add insult to injury, as we, see, as we say, God gave him children, not just legitimate children, but illegitimate children. Recall the backstory that we looked at last week as we kind of set the plate. This history of the kings in verse 1 of chapter 1, you got two divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah that continue to be involved in political deal makings with international powers. And they're relying on their own plans, their own efforts at preservation, and yet they used to not be a nation. When they went into Egypt land, there were not a nation, and there was hundreds of thousands that came out. God made them a nation who was not a nation. And they start getting too big for their britches, thinking, hey, look at us. 
Our brains, our brawn has got us here. And you got the kings of Judah and Israel leading it. Self-preservation. No different than how we act today. They weren't reliant on Yahweh. So God warns of coming judgment and he urges repentance because he'll ultimately bring to pass the nearer fulfillments using his international instruments of Assyria to secure the downfall of that northern kingdom in 722 B.C. And his employment of Babylon would do the same for Judah in three stages, 605 B.C., 597, and 586. They thought, we're too big and too powerful. Look at this great land that we have built. That's why when Paul instructs the saints at Corinth, about how much we can learn from Old Testament Israel. He says, be careful of overconfidence. If any man thinks he stand, take heed lest he fall. You follow Israel's trajectory, you'll get their results. So friends, notice with me this bizarre command, a dysfunctional and blended family, and the glimmers of restored Israel that we find in verses 2 to 11. I'll begin reading for us in Hosea 1, 2. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of harlotry, and have children of harlotry, for the land commits flagrant harlotry forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, name him Jezreel for yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel. And I'll put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Then she conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And after the Lord said to him, name her Lo-Ruhamah, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel that I would ever forgive them. But I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them by the Lord their God and will not deliver them by bow, sword, battle, horses, or horsemen. When she'd wean lo Ruhamah, she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said, name him lo for you are not my people. And I am not your God. If we had to stop there in the story, (laughs) talk about a black backdrop. So he gives us a little glimmer of hope here in verse 10. Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. And the sons of Judah, the sons of Israel will be gathered together and they will appoint for themselves one leader. And they will go up from the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Wait a minute. Great will be the days of Jezreel, and yet his firstborn child was named Jezreel, speaking of the punishment that he would bring about his people. So we start off with this bizarre command of verse 2. No matter how bizarre... This was the plan and command of God. Hosea is divinely called to his prophetic task. In the first phrase of the first verse, we were told that the word of the Lord came to Hosea. It came to this prophet just like it did to Joel in Joel 1.1 or Jonah Jonah in Jonah 1.1, Micah, Zephaniah, Zechariah, and so the word of the Lord came to his prophet Hosea. And he gives this shocking charge. It's meant with all of its shock value. There is no way to minimize the jaw-dropping nature of this command. It's so bizarre. He says, go and take yourself a wife of harlotry. And the emphasis is literally, get going, marry. Spare no time. And so you singles in our midst think you're in a pucker to get married. Look at what Hosea's got to do. And 
It's not the cream of the crop that he gets to take as his bride. She may have been that way. She may have walked down the aisle in her white wedding dress. She probably was not a prostitute when they got married. When he says, when God says to Hosea, take to yourself, the verb is laka. And that's the way the Hebrew expresses the concept of legal marriage. You know, I remember talking to the guy that came in for counsel. And uh, there's a lot of conflict in the relationship. And uh, I didn't know the situation as a biblical counselor. I got to get data and get information. And so day one of counseling and he says, there's all this conflict on, in our relationship. Well, come to find out they're shacked up together. I said, oh, so you're, so you're fornicating. And you're wondering why there's conflict. It's not that Christian marriage is without conflict, but there's no commitment without marriage. With Christ, the center of the home, where he's given every resource to be a Christ-exalting husband and a Christ-exalting wife. It's a shocking command. It's an attention-arresting command. Take to yourself, in legal marriage, a woman of prostitution and have, have and produce children of prostitution. The Hebrew root of these words that are coming fast in verse number two of prostitution and whoredom and harlotry, it'll occur twice more in this verse. And then 18 more times in the remainder of the book, 21 in all. You don't have to wonder um, the main theme in the book of Hosea. Yeah, it goes on for chapters. Now remember, this is not setting a requirement or a pattern for us. Nor is the subject matter something over which you and I as believers ought to blush. If God talks about it, we need to talk about it. Too often, even in Christian homes, sex is a bad word. It's not a good word. Marriage bed is pure, holy, and undefiled, Hebrews 13. Believers have a tendency to be uncomfortable over issues that they have sinful views of, things that God has originally provided pure, holy, and undefiled, and yet has been twisted by Satan, God's arch enemy, and by sinful man thinking that all of God's prohibitions are to castigate them and come out of a heart of love instead of a heart of love where God puts parameters for His glory and for our good. Anyways, a lot of ink has been spilt over this bizarre command. Some think in it not to be taken literally, which they falsely suppose would impugn the character of God. How could God call his pure prophet who's going to speak forth his word to marry a wicked woman? A woman who already had the reputation of a prostitute. Well, go back to the Mosaic law and you're thinking. It was only priests that would, that would have been forbidden of. Yet we must affirm the, the perspicuity or the clarity of Scripture and a normally literal hermeneutic which believes that this is exactly what happened. A straightforward reading of Scripture, you've got the prophet of God commanded to literally marry a woman who would become a prostitute. You know, anything short of a straightforward sense makes the analogy throughout the book at best an anemic parallel doesn't accomplish what God set it about to accomplish if you try to tone it down. So this is when the, the Lord first spoke through Hosea. The Lord said, go take to yourself a wife of harlotry. You have children of harlotry for the land commits flagrant harlotry. Notice that little preposition for? He's given us the reason. Who are they forsaken? Yahweh. That's ludicrous. The one who brought you out of the land, the one who parted the Red Sea and you walked through as on dry land, the one who rained manna down miraculously, food for you to eat, and your sandals didn't wear out for those 40 years in the wilderness. Yeah, that Yahweh. You've forsaken him. And this is the, the fourth time of nearly 50 occurrences 
of the memorial name Yahweh in Hosea, and we're only in verse number 2. In the subsequent chapters, although His people are unfaithful, He will remain faithful and merciful as the great I Am. You remember when Moses is walking about, and he sees that this bush is on fire, and yet its fuel is not burned up. It keeps on burning and burning and burning. And all of a sudden, a voice comes out of that bush, and it tells him, take your sandals off. The place where you're standing is holy ground. In Exodus 3 and verse 13, After God had just said, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt, he says to God, behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what's his name? What do I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The self-existent one, the one who has power in and of himself and is never exhausted of that power as he utilizes that. The self-existent one, the great I am. Verse 15 of Exodus 3, God furthermore said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord The God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. This is what he'd be known by. So, God just told us in Hosea 1.12 that the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking Yahweh. That one. This is a treasured and special reality that the sons of Israel forgot. People had apostatized by the time of Hosea as they abandoned following Yahweh. So this picture of prostitution joins ranks with many other word groups and images that chronicle the the treacherous infidelity of God's sinning people. One of these Word families will occur later on in Hosea 5 and Hosea 6. It also shows up five times in various forms in infamous, infamous contexts, like in Malachi 2, where treachery after treachery after treachery, unfaithfulness after unfaithfulness to the faithful Yahweh. So we see the bizarre command in Hosea 1 2. Verses 3 to 7, we see what we might refer to as a dysfunctional or blended family. The stage is being set with Hosea's progeny who will dramatically represent the Lord's unfaithful people whose spiritual adultery is about to be exposed for the purpose of warning and judgment. These may be children that came from her her immoral relationships or may be speaking that they are committing the same immoral acts of mom. In other words, the children come to be like their mother. As often, the influence of parents will have this kind of result in their children's lives. Some commentators hold that Gomer was a prostitute before marriage. I don't necessarily follow along like some other commentators. Like many, I'd I'd see the relationship starting pure, and she just finally goes upside down. The first child mentioned, legitimate, with the other two probably illegitimate. Notice the first of these children, and and I'll explain to you why. So you got the the legitimate son, Jezreel, verses 3 to 5. Hosea went and took Gomer the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. This is the same language that you read all throughout the Hebrew Bible about when a man and a woman come together in the marriage bed and a child is conceived and given to their spouse. The Lord says that 
He's to name him Jezreel. There's obviously figurative freight regarding this firstborn son's name. What's the significance of Jezreel? Why are you going to name him that? There's historic roots from the name Jezreel in Jehu, a prominent person along with a place of warfare and bloodshed. These historic word roots could be tapped into several different historical situations, various people, various places. Probably what's being referred to is the city where Jehu slaughtered the house of Ahab, 2 Kings 9 and 10. But regardless of the time past and all the contributing situations looked back to, it's also looking ahead to a future day when that blood of Jehu would be avenged. What is crystal clear, regardless of the person Jezreel or the place Jezreel, what's crystal clear is the imminent judgment that God will bring. Notice God tells him in verse 4 to name him Jezreel. Because in a little while, I'm going to punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel. And I'll, I'll put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day, I'll break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. You know, a bow was your main warfare instrument. It's figurative of power. So this is speaking of a loss of power when the bow is broken. Most often in the prophets, that day, quote unquote, refers back to or stands for the day of Yahweh. The day of the Lord often had implications for historic times when God dramatically and powerfully broke into human affairs. And it frequently looks ahead to that final fulfillment in the eschaton. So regardless of what Assyria would do, regardless of what Babylon would do, they ought to learn the lesson well because that's nothing compared to what God would eventually do in his judgment. By the way, Jezreel and Israel are close sound-alikes in the Hebrew the event in 722 within Hosea's own ministry time in 733 with the campaign of Tiglath-Pileser that actually took place, God accomplished this. God naming this child will set up an astonishing antithetical application with the next chapter when we get to chapter 2, where the Lord reveals he'll ultimately sow them back into the promised land. You know, if God just uh, stopped the story at judgment, he would be just. And yet this is grace upon grace. That after his purging judgments, he will lavish them with grace and favor, which is so undeserved. Let me remind you of the place Jezreel. Jezreel was once the place, the scene of Gideon's stunning victory of Judges chapter 6. Open your eyes and look around the angelic host. But the tables would turn. God was with Gideon then in Judges 6, but he was not with Israel in Hosea's day. The geographical area was the same, but what was lacking was humble dependence on Yahweh. Gideon was a Yahweh fearer. Hosea's people were a treacherous people. And that's why he had to go through and obey God to do this marriage that it might be the grand object lesson of God's people. Flagrant harlotry, forsaken the Lord. God promises in one day he's going to break the bow of Israel. So firstborn child, Jezreel. Then you've got Illegitimate daughter, Lo Ruhama, verses 6 and 7. Then she conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Name her Lo Ruhama, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel that I would ever forgive them, but I'll have compassion on the house of Judah. <laughs> Why are you taking it out on Israel, God, and you're, you're saving Judah? Well, Judah better l- listen or the same thing will happen. You have the same verbs for conceive and 
birth, as found in verse 3, but with the addition of again. So she has another child, this time a daughter. And God's somber explanation of the choice of this particular name is just heart-stopping. Her name means not received compassion, no mercy. Imagine one of those walks one day during early childhood when having a daddy-daughter date and, Dad, why'd you call me not pitied? And he gets the opportunity to point her to Yahweh because it's still a gospel issue. God said, I'll no longer deal compassionately with Israel. I certainly will not forgive them, exclamation point. Does that not go down a little bit sideways? Don't we have to choke on that? Dear friends, too many people impose upon the grace and goodness of God that there comes a time where God's mercy runs out. You know that when the Scriptures read today is the day of salvation, that means that it's not tomorrow. We're not guaranteed to even be around and breathing tomorrow. Tomorrow's the devil's day. Stop listening to him. Today's the day of salvation. Isaiah says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You know, they are the ones who'd broken the covenant obligations in rebellion, not Yahweh. They're the ones who were in need of repentance, not Yahweh. Such is the case with all who reject the gospel. What you're doing is renunciating the grace of God. If you're with us here this morning or joining us live stream, stop this moment and cry out to God about what it means to be saved. What it means to repent and turn from your sins biblically and place your faith in the finished work of Christ. I wonder if Hosea had those opportunities with his precious daughter not pitied, who would illustrate Israel who would no longer be pitied by God. It's jaw-dropping significance. You know, the the vocab and the grammar and theology of verse 6 Combined in such a way that the breath of the original hearers had to have been sucked out of them. No longer, not again, while they were imposing on His grace. That God would withhold one of His chief attributes of grace, Rahamim, His mercy, His compassion, His love, His pity. Not so, we scream in our bad theology. This was one of Yahweh's first attributes articulated by the Lord Himself to Moses, not at the burning bush, but at Sinai in Exodus 34, if you wanted to join me there. Exodus 34, verses 5 to 7, from the the quill of... Moses himself, Exodus 34, 5. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord, whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, and bronze, and blue. You know, that's a good chapter, but uh, the wrong one. I meant 35, I wanted 34. Exodus 34, 5. Let's try this again. The Lord descended in the cloud, and he stood there with him as he called upon the name of of Yahweh. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. This is over-the-top loving-kindness of Yahweh, unlike all the heathen gods and the nations that were around Israel while they're cuddling up in bed with those apostate nations. They'd forgotten this. You know, the word's root is related to a mother's womb, this, this pity, this mercy. 
And yet it even convey, conveys God's fatherly side, His personal care in Psalm 103.8. You know, even in the midst of the rubble of Yahweh's righteous judgment, Jeremiah cries out in Lamentations 3.22 that his mercies never come to an end. And yet here Hosea has the audacity through the inspiration of the Spirit moving him along to pen Scripture announces that his mercies will cease. Are Scriptures contradicting each other? Not at all meant to flesh out that this is indeed the worst kind of bad news that could ever be possible. In verse 7 of Hosea 1, he, God says, I'll, I'll have compassion on the house of Judah. I'll deliver them by the Lord their God and will not deliver them by bow, sword, battle, horses, or horsemen. You know, that little word, but... The contrast between Israel and Judah stands at the head of the verse. Yet, I'll have compassion on Judah. Remember this term, deliver or save, is from the same Hebrew root word from which the prophet's own name was derived, Hosea. God's sovereign grace is truly amazing. And yet understand how contrasting this is to Yahweh's unfaithful people when it came to the local or international threats. Instead of fearing and trusting God, they feared man. They trust in the making of the covenants with the nations, not the covenant they made with Yahweh. And they thought that they'd defend them from the enemy's attack. You know, Isaiah gives us uh, a case in point example in Isaiah 31. Isaiah 31, 1 to 3. Let's see if we can get the right chapter this time. The prophet says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses. That's exactly what the people of Hosea's do, day are doing. Who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. Yet he also is wise and will bring disaster and does not retract his words, but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the help of the workers of iniquity. Now the Egyptians are, are men and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. So the Lord will stretch out his hand and he, he who helps will stumble. He who is helped will fall and all of them will come to an end together. They're all going to fall in the ditch together because they weren't seeking Yahweh. Such is man's help. How about you today? As you sell your soul to your employer, and yet personal and family devotions go out the window, your service to the Lord, your own personal sanity is sacrificed over the busyness of life. Something's got to change. Well, as if the picture, the, the script of Hosea's life is not bleak enough. He has another child, verses 8 and 9. This time, and probably an illegitimate son, after the weaning of Lo Ruhamah, this second son is introduced, and God says, you're to name him Lo Ami, for you're not my people and I'm not your God. Regardless of the fact of verse 2, that the people had departed from the Lord in their, in their unfaithfulness, whoring and going after other gods, she's guilty of the vilest adultery. Time and time again, whoring after the nations, the brains and the brawn of those around them. Man is a horrible trust. Now think of, think for just a moment how unacceptable God's statement is here to so many people theologically, and yet it's God's word. He says, not my people, and I am not your God. Did you know that God does not love everyone unconditionally? Yeah, I actually said it. 
God gives common grace to all. The rains fall on the just and the unjust alike. God has been so kind to rebels who shake their fist in His face. He does, God would have been just when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, smite them out. He said, in the day you eat it, you shall surely die. Well, immediately they did die spiritually, but to die in the flesh took a while. That's common grace. He does indeed pass over many people that He does not set His love on in a saving way, leading them to faith and repentance. Heaven is going to be well populated, but guess what? So is hell. What about God's sovereign election of Israel to be His especially treasured people? Remember the the many elements of conditionality that we read in Scripture. We could go to Genesis or 2 Samuel, Exodus, Deuteronomy. I'm not taking us to any of those. Go with me to Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus 26 as just a sampling. Leviticus 26 contains blessings for covenant obedience, curses for disobedience. Obey me, I'll bless your socks off in the Mosaic economy as if they had socks. But disobey me, you're going to suffer the consequences, the curses of, in the covenant. Well, near the end of the section in the blessings of obedience, Yahweh says in verse number 12, I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. It doesn't get any better than that, to walk with God. And the passage goes on to say, but if you do not listen to me and do not do all these commandments, so listen again to God's word through his prophet Hosea of not my people and not your God with this frame of reference. In Leviticus 26, where there's opportunities graciously granted for repentance. Notice verses 40 and following. Leviticus 26, 40. If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers in their unfaithfulness which they committed against me and also in their acting with hostility against me, I also was acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies. And if their uncircumcised heart becomes humble so that they then make amends for their iniquity, then I'll remember my covenant with Jacob. I'll remember well and I will... I I think I missed a line. I'm starting back over in verse 42 here. Then I'll remember my covenant with Jacob and I will remember also my covenant with Isaac, my covenant with Abraham as well, and I'll remember the land. For the land will be abandoned by them and will make up for its Sabbaths while it is made desolate without them. They, meanwhile, will be making amends for their iniquity because they rejected my ordinances and their soul abhorred my statutes. There was covenant infidelity. God reaffirms his promise of restoration. Verse 44, in spite of this, when the land of their enemies, I won't reject them. Nor will I so abhor them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. I'll remember for them the covenant with their ancestors who I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. God's not going to forsake His promises to the patriarchs. When He says, you are currently not my people, repent. Turn to Yahweh. It's not over yet. When they went in discipline to Babylon and Assyria, that they might repent. This is coming out of the the generous, loving heart of God. When God takes His children to the woodshed, Hebrews chapter 12, He does it, why? Because He loves us. It's not merely punitive. It is corrective. You know, here it sounds in in, in Hosea like a a final divorce pronouncement. And this wasn't just a matter of irreconcilable differences, but exceedingly culpable forms of spiritual idolatry and adultery. 
And yet we're about to be hit shockingly with God's inexplicable mercy with this first of the book's reversals. Go back with me to our text here in, in Hosea. Let's look at glimmers of restored Israel, this future hope, because without hope, there's nothing. You know, Hosea begins with this little yet in verse 10, yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea. You know, as Yahweh's unfathomable sovereign grace is highlighted in these verses, in the Hebrew, verse 10 begins chapter 2, and yet it relates to verse 9. At the same moment, he says, Lo, a me, you're not my people, and I am not your God. He hasn't cast them off permanently. When you read those words, they'll be like the sand of the sea. It seems though we've heard this elsewhere in the Abrahamic promise, covenant. A contrast is intended here between verses 9 and 10. Though in Hosea's day, God was disclaiming the Israelites as His people, in a day to come, He'll make their number like the sand on the seashore, which is incalculable. God had both a message of warning and a message of hope come out of the same lips. Said differently, he has not forgotten his promise to Abraham in spite of the unfaithfulness of his people. He remains faithful, he cannot deny himself. Sons of Judah, sons of Israel will be gathered together, verse 11 tells us. Hosea makes clear the time of future hope will involve both nations, both the northern and the southern tribes. The whole enchilada. When is that time? Curious minds are wondering. Well, we've got a little clue here. They will appoint for themselves one leader. Notice that in the middle of verse 11. They will appoint for themselves one leader. This is clue number one, identifying this hope for day, yet future to them. Got another clue. They will come up out of the land, the land best seen as Egypt, which we'd already read about from Isaiah, those that are going to Egypt for help instead of going to Yahweh. God's going to send His enemies to His people to chasten them and take them away for a time. Come up out of the land. Third clue, great will be the day of Jezreel. Even though at the beginning of the chapter, this firstborn child is meant to remind about judgment coming. And yet, that same name, Jezreel, remind of this future hope. Something will be outstanding about that day. Jezreel not only looks back in verses 4 and 5, where Israel's defeat in the valley is predicted by Yahweh, but it's a look forward to the next chapter, where Jezreel stands for Israel. Israel will be restored. In other words, when there is the divorce, there is that glorious remarriage that, the, that Hosea and Gomer would be the object lessons of. The one period that best fits all three clues is that thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on planet Earth from the throne of David. In the millennium, she'll see a time of reborn glory when her chosen leader will be Christ himself. And as we think not only about the treachery and the total depravity and sin of man and unfaithfulness of God's people, what shines brightest in the book of Hosea is God's love beyond degree, His sovereign grace so undeserved. Hang it on these three thoughts. You got the promise of population increase that contrasts the termination of the kingdom of Israel. If verse 4 is bad news, when God says, I'll put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel, and yet our English chapter ends on this upbeat of hope. There's a second contrast. 
Not only the promise of population increase, but the promise of return from captivity contrast to the breaking of Israel's bow. Back in verse 5, God said, you're going without power, I'm going to break your bow in the valley of Jezreel. But there's coming a time of this restoration where there will be a regathered Israel as the center of focus and earthly power. Promise of population increase, promise of return from captivity. Though you're going to the woodshed in the foreign countries, I'll gather you back to myself. Thirdly, the promise of the unity of the people under one leader contrasts to God's rejection as indicated by the names of children. Now we understand Gomer. Gomer has become synonymous with the unfaithfulness in marriage and illustrates the unfaithfulness of people betrothed to their God, Yahweh. And the whole family tree from Jezreel in verse 4 no mercy, lo Ruhama in verse 6, and not my people, lo me, verse 9. We see these glimmers of God not casting off people forever if they but repent and believe. Notice how verse, uh, chapter 2 begins. And just, just a glimmer of what we're getting into next week. Say to your brothers, ah me. What happened to lo me? No longer. And to your sisters, Ruhama. My people, mercy. You know, in your further readings of Hosea, you're going to notice that the warning sections of the book steadily intensify, eventually becoming terrifyingly graphic in their depiction of a violent future event that awaited them. A bit of the historical context helps us understand why the warnings come with such ferocious intensity. Hosea is is admonishing a generation of Israelites. They're enjoying a resurgence of national political power. It's great to be strong. Riding a wave of financial prosperity. Look at what Yahweh's done. And in the midst of such political peace and opulence, the doom of the impending judgment of God seemed utterly inconceivable. There is no way such a thing would devastate God's elect people. Really. Hosea's thunderous forewarnings probably seemed ridiculous to his audience. And yet the proximity of that generation to the fulfillment of such dreadful affliction helps us understand the severity of God's words through Hosea our own times and our own lives. God's judgments on his people are not the end of the story. The Lord will not, he could not utterly annihilate his chosen nation. He promised to make them a great nation. To do so would be to renege on his promises that he made to the patriarchs. But this same God loves his people too much to abandon them in their sinful rebellion. Let him go to hell in a handbasket. His compassion can never indifferently ignore their persistent unfaithfulness. Does the wisest man Solomon not tell us that the kisses of an enemy are deceitful but faithful the wounds of a friend? One who loves you enough to say an ace is an ace, a spade is a spade, and sin, sin. Turn from it. Get right with God that he might bless you. The Lord's affliction of his people is not said in contrast to his love. Instead, his chastisement is an expression of his love, according to Hebrews 12, 6 and 7. His consoling assurances of ultimate blessing of his children are not a reversal of his intention to bring his people low through suffering. Both discipline and restoration are equally reliable, sure words from Yahweh. Both are ultimately motivated by incomprehensible compassion described by the old hymn writer Isaac Watts as amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Would you pray with me? Father, as a biblical theology takes us low over our own depravity and sin issues, we are Gomer. We are an unfaithful people. And as you humble us, you do not decimate us. 
that your chastenings are for a time that we might turn to you in greater trust and obedience. And so have your will and way in our lives as we freshly recount the wounds of Christ, that you made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteous of God in him, that your own beloved one, the Lord Jesus, the sinless one, the guiltless one, was treated guilty and faced our death that he might give us his life and clothe us in his perfections so that as you look upon us, you look upon us through the blood of your Son. Thank you that it is indeed eternal life and we will never perish. No man can pluck us out of your hands. Chastening is never fun, but as you do chasten your true children, grow us in holiness for the praise of your great name. Thank you for this love beyond degree. Continue to unpack it in our hearts, in our affections, in our lives, in our decision-making this week. For we pray it in the name of your all-glorious Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen.